I want to welcome you all to the third annual autism symposium put on by PESI. Um, we're glad you're here. And I have the pleasure and distinct, distinct just privilege of introducing Temple Grandin. She's been featured in HBO documentary or HBO shows. She has um, done more for the field of autism in the last 30 years than most people can in their lifetime and is a New York Times opinion post writer. Um, and her new book, Visual Thinking, is what we'll be talking about today. And she's also done a ton for the field of animal ethics. And so hats off. Welcome, Temple. Well, it's great to be here by Zoom. And on that first slide, there's a cover of a new book, Visual Thinking. And what I'm getting really interested in now is helping kids that have an autism label or ADHD, a dyslexia label, get good jobs. I'm going to be discussing different kinds of thinking and the kind of jobs that they might be good at. And one of my big concerns is we're doing a pretty good job with the little kids on early intervention, but where we're really falling down is the transfer to adulthood. That is the problem. I spent 25 years in heavy construction working with big Cargill plants uh, in Canada and the United States designing equipment. I worked with shop people that owned their own shops that a good percentage of them probably were autistic and they owned businesses. So I wanna help these kids do everything they do. One of the big problems that we've got with the autism spectrum is it ranges from Einstein who had no speech until age three, he'd land in an autism program to somebody who can't dress themselves. And it all has the same name. Let's go to the next slide. The first step, that teachers need to realize and parents need to realize is that there is different kinds of thinking. And when you have somebody with an autism label, they're going more extreme on the different kinds of thinking. I do a lot of talks to businesses. I said, the first thing you have to realize is different thinking exists. I'm an extreme visual thinker. I didn't know that other people thought verbally until I was in my thirties. That was a shock to me. Let's go to the next slide. Now being a visual thinker helped me in my work with cattle because I looked at what they're looking at. Here's my own shadow right there, scaring cattle. Well, to me, that's super obvious, but I find a lot of people, I gotta train them to look for these sort of things. We'll go to the next slide. Now in engineering, there's two different ways that you can, you can assess risk that something might have a problem. You can calculate risk. This is the launch pad that the successful Artemis rocket went off on. And I uh, was in this launch pad five years ago, a really cool visit to Cape Kennedy, and I found something in the launch pad that shouldn't be there. Nobody else saw it, and he's on the next slide. And I watched him waddle down the stairs at seven o'clock in the morning, yeah, show what was in the launch pad on the next slide. Okay, put the next slide up. Well, and I found equipment inside there that has to do with fueling that I don't want him peeing on or chewing. You see, I see that they were using that launch pad base as a workshop. And this guy was inside there with the fueling equipment. Nobody else knew he was there. I just saw the motion and noticed it. And I'm sure they got rid of him by the time they put the rocket on it. Let's go to the next slide. Now, in science, we need the visual thinkers like me, you can't do algebra. But we also need the mathematicians and science is getting more and more mathematical. We're doing fancy, fancy statistics, but millions of dollars worth of cancer research was ruined because the different labs use different devices to mix up their cells, little $300 devices. And it completely changed the results. Yes, I reviewed journal articles and this is the kind of stuff I get after. You didn't tell me how you bedded your rats. That's gonna affect their behavior. Yeah, methods matter, but you see, I see that. You no, know, can't do algebra, scientists still needs me. Let's go to the next slide. Now there's three different types of thinking. We can go on to the next slide. Now I'm what's called an object visualizer. So let's look at the kind of careers that I would be good at. Mechanical equipment. I worked with people who owned metal shops that were in patenting and inventing mechanical equipment graphic design, photography, highly skilled trades, like car repair, electrician. And one of the worst things that schools ever did is taking out all the shop classes, sewing classes, cooking classes, art, music. 
because these are all places where kids that are different can find careers. You know, if this is the kind of stuff I'd be good at, can't do algebra. I worked with all kinds of shop guys, barely graduated from high school, patenting equipment, equipment that's still being used in beef plants. This is what makes me go crazy, is going back and forth between the autism world and the, uh, you know, and the industrial world. And where we're falling down is making the transfer to the world of work. Kids have got to start learning job skills, chores, volunteer jobs where somebody's a boss outside the family, shopping. I'm appalled at the number of teenagers, fully verbal, never gone shopping. They're not learning bank account and saving money. Basic skills, things I learned in elementary school. Let's go to the next slide. Now, the next kind of thinker is your spatial thinker. These are your mathematicians. They think patterns. Half of Silicon Valley is probably on the spectrum. Computer programming, engineering, physics, quantum computing. These are things in the future that you'll need algebra for and all kinds of higher math. So how do you figure out what kind of a thinker a young kid is? Do they like art? Do they love mathematics? Do they like to build things with Legos? But I'm seeing too many kids growing up today, they've never used a tool. So not learning skills that can they can use in the workplace. Let's go to the next slide. And then the verbal thinkers. And a lot of educators are verbal thinkers. And they think completely in words. And the other problem with verbal thinking is they tend to overgeneralize. Okay, so we got this autism label. I see all the different kind of severity levels in it. But you get some of the things verbally, they'll just say, well, how do I teach autistic kids? Well, I've got to going to tell you my standard stuff for little kids, early intervention. Or what are we going to do with an autistic teenager trying to get the first job? I want to avoid the multitasking craziness that I want to avoid that. Take out window, I want to avoid that. Let's go to the next slide. Now, there's science that shows that these different kinds of thinking really exist. In my book on visual thinking right here, and of course, Amazon's got plenty of them. I have a whole chapter where I go over the science to show you this is a real thing. Lots of so-called normal people are mixtures of the different kinds of thinking. But to get someone with a label, you might have an extreme object visualizer like me or an extreme mathematician. Let's go to the next slide. And a lot of people are mixtures of the different kinds of thinking. Let's go to the next slide. Turns out I've got a huge uh, visual thinking circuit in my head. Go to the next slide. This is another picture of the visual thinking circuit, a huge graphics card. Yeah. And the abstract math department's not there because there's nothing for me to visualize in pictures. Let's go to the next slide. Now, what's my preferred way of taking in information? If somebody wants to explain to me how a water pump works, I'd rather look at the pictures and the diagrams. The verbal people would rather read how it works, and the mathematician tends to look at both. Let's go to the next slide. Now let's look at how people plan projects. So this study, they got high school art students, high school science students, and high school literature and humanity students to uh, draw pictures of the planets they were going to invent. And the art students made fantastic things with pyramids and office buildings on it and crystals and all kinds of weird stuff. The science students kind of boring, explain the atmosphere and the gravity. And then the verbal students. Well, they started writing down, and then they realized they're supposed to make a drawing, so they did some splotches. But the thing that shocked me about this study, the verbal thinkers didn't do any planning. It was big, broad concepts, where the other two groups had big planning sessions on how they were going to design their planet. Let's go to the next slide. Verbal thinkers overgeneralize. Verbal thinking is top-down. A lot of educational concepts, very top-down. But how do we actually implement it? How do we actually get things done? How do we do it? Let's go to the next slide. Let's look at the early inventors. They were probably all my kind of mind, object visualizers. All the early inventions that were in the patented, they were all devices, mechanical devices. I'll tell you one way to get the young adults off the of video games, car mechanics. That's actually been successful. Five or six successes. And they found out motors are much more interesting than video games. Now, if they were playing video games and getting fabulous jobs, I would not be criticizing, but they're not getting fabulous jobs. Let's go to the next slide. Then the inventor of the 3D printer, another visual thinker, 
go on to the next slide. Now, the problem is, is in North America, we're actually losing skills. And where we're losing skills are these shop guys that invent all of the clever mechanical equipment. Since they took the shop classes out of the schools, they're playing video games in the basement when they need to be building stuff that we're not making anymore. Let's go to the next slide. We don't make the state-of-the-art 3D printers. Let's go to the next slide. We don't make the state-of-the-art electronic chip-making machine. That's the inside of it. Okay, I'll show you the outside of it. Lots of mechanical devices. It comes from Holland. And that goes back to the educational system. When a kid is in ninth grade, they can decide to go university or go tech route, and they don't stick their nose up at the tech route because kids in the tech route built this, and we don't make this absolute state-of-the-art electronic chip-making machine. Yeah, there's a connection here with autism. Let's go to the next slide. We don't make the state-of-the-art electron microscope. We can go to the next slide. And this is a pork processing plant. I took this picture in 2019. I went to two of these. This equipment's all from Holland. Same thing for the state-of-the-art poultry processing plant. Yeah, we are paying for changes we made in the educational system, you know, 20, 25 years ago. Some of the states in the U.S. are starting to put these classes back in. Let's go to the next slide. We don't make the cloth for the parachute that landed on Mars. Go to the next slide. And then I went out to the Steve Jobs Theater just before COVID shut everything down. Structural glass walls from Italy and Germany and the roof from Dubai. And I'm standing in the middle of it screaming, we don't make it anymore. And there's a connection here between this and what's going on in special education. Because the kids that should be building this stuff, they're playing video games in the basement. Let's go to the next slide. All right, we paid the price for taking out all these hands-on classes that are listed on these, this slide. When I was in elementary school, I loved sewing, art, and uh, woodworking. I just loved those classes. I would have hated school if I hadn't had those classes. Now, I want to just add, I had some great mentors, a great speech teacher. One of the things my speech teacher did with me is she slowed down when she talked. Otherwise, the words went to gibberish. She gave me time to respond. Other thing that she did was uh, lots of emphasis on how to take turns, how to wait and take turns. And then basic skills like dressing, eating with utensils. Those would come up with outcomes I'd want for three-year-olds. Let's go to the next slide. I absolutely couldn't do algebra. I'm seeing students that want to become a veterinary nurse, and they've now failed their second or their third algebra class. I think we've got to be looking at, do we need algebra for a veterinary nurse? Well, some people think you need algebra for logical thinking. Well, not if you're an object visualizer. And when I did a book signing in October for this book out in California, we did it in a school. And I talked to a headmaster who didn't even know what my kind of thinking was. He didn't know it existed. And I said, who do you think is going to keep the air conditioning on in your school? It's not going to be more likely to be the university person. Heating and air conditioning, we got a huge shortage of people. Great trade. Let's go to the next slide. My grandfather was a co-inventor of the autopilot for airplanes. MIT trained engineer worked with an autistic guy. They tinkered in a loft until they got it to work. But it got ripped off, and the ripoff was on every airplane during World War II. Yeah, they needed a verbal thinker. They needed a lawyer. We really do need the different kinds of minds. Let's go to the next slide. Now, let's look at who builds big processing plants, like big Cargill plants. I worked on the, there's two Cargill plants in Canada, the one in uh, Alberta. I did a lot, I laid out the whole yard for that, drew up all the steel and concrete work. Now, my kind of thinker, who's terrible at math, barely graduated from high school, invents highly specialized mechanical equipment. And then the more visual, spatial, mathematical thinkers, they do the boilers and refrigeration. Little shop people I worked with, they didn't touch boilers and refrigeration. We didn't understand that stuff. This is where you where you have the mathematical engineers. But where we're losing the skills is in what I call the clever engineering department. A brand new poultry plant just opened in Canada. All the equipment inside that plant. I'm not talking about refrigeration, but all of the mechanical equipment. It's from Holland. 
Let's go to the next slide. Now, how did Betsy and I collaborate on writing Visual Thank You? You see, I'm kind of disorganized. So I would do the rough drafts for a chapter for visual thinking. And Betsy, my super verbal co-writer, she would do a beautiful job of uh, kind of straightening out my thoughts, making them more linear. So here we work together, complementary skills. Let's go to the next slide. Well, you need the different kinds of thinkers in building a building. The architects are going to make it pretty. The engineers are going to make it work. But I've been, I, I get this Business Week magazine and they advertise big fancy silver towers, uh, sk skinny towers, you know, 70 floors of apartments. All I can think about is I hope the water pumps are going to work or the elevator's going to keep working. I wouldn't want to walk up 60 floors. Wouldn't want to do that. That's the kind of stuff I think about. Let's go to the next slide. 20% of the people I work on big beef plants. There's one of them in Canada. There's actually two of them in Alberta. Owned metalworking shops, multiple patents, designing and building complex equipment. None of them could do algebra. And one of them has a corporate jet. And he's a big company now. I remember when he was a tiny shop in the early 90s. Let's go to the next slide. Grandparents come up to me all the time. And they discover they're autistic when the kids get diagnosed. And these grandparents often have good jobs because they learned working skills young. They had paper routes. Now, we don't have paper routes anymore. But it's important for these autistic teenagers to be learning how to do a task on a schedule outside the home. And one of the big problems I'm seeing now is moms that simply can't let go. I'm appalled at the number of kids never gone shopping. Now, how do we learn money? The way I learned money was I got 50 cents a week for allowance and I knew exactly what I could buy with them. Maybe about $5 now. I could get 10 candy bars or five Superman comics. But if I wanted a 69 cent airplane, I had to save. And mother never bought allowance items. So how did I learn about bigger amounts of money? One of my favorite games was a hockey table set that I got. I saw it in the toy store window. It was $21. And I calculated that was a year's worth of allowance. So a $20 bill in the 50s was a hockey table. And 50 cents was five Superman comics. You see, you've got to get the money related back to real things. And I want to commend all the great teachers and mentors I had. I had a great science teacher got me motivated to study. Let's go to the next slide. What would happen to some of our top innovators today? What would happen to Thomas Edison Einstein if they're in today's educational system? I don't think it would be very good. Let's go to the next slide. How about Michelangelo? Grubby little 12-year-old, dropped out of school. Uh, you know, kind of a naughty little slob. But he was running around in all the churches, uh, uh, seeing great art, and was brought up with stone cutting tools. So this brings up an important thing. To get into good careers, it starts with exposure, then mentoring. And then some artists saw his work and apprenticed him into their shop. I got into the cattle industry because I was exposed to it when I was a teenager. And then I had some good mentors. Let's go to the next slide. Uh, Steve Jobs probably on the spectrum, bullied in school. I was bullied horribly in high school, hated high school. And the only places I had friends were friends through shared interests. I cannot emphasize that enough, friends through shared interests. It might be band or music, or it could be a math club, robotics club. For me, it was horses, electronics, and uh, uh, model rockets. Einstein uh, was playing the violin. I uh, worked for the patent office. That got him exposed to a whole lot of new ideas. Let's go to the next slide. Thomas Edison probably was on the autism spectrum, but learned how to work at an early age and got mentored. He had a mentor that taught him how to be a telegraph operator. Really important. Let's go to the next slide. Elon Musk is on the spectrum. Uh, we'll have to wait and see what happens with Twitter. That has social connotations that cars and rockets don't have. But um, he got exposed to a lot of that stuff, learned how to work at a really early age. I cannot emphasize how important that is. Let's go to the next slide. The Nobel Prize winner was 50% more likely to have an arts and crafts hobby 
compared to other scientists. That's another reason why we shouldn't be taking these things out. But I'm seeing too many parents and teachers getting locked into the label. And they don't think their kid can learn to do anything. You see, I'm a bottom-up thinker. So in order for me to learn, you got to get me out doing things. I've had parents say when they finally got their kid the right job, like maybe a job at an office supply store, and they say, well, he just blossomed or she just bloomed. You got to get them out. Let's go to the next slide. Now, here are some tips for working with the minds that are different. Avoid the heavy multitasking jobs. Long strings of verbal information doesn't work. Like blah, 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 do this. Give them a pilot's checklist on how to close out the Walmart cash register. It's a very simple step-by-step -step written pilot's checklist. We've got to stretch these kids and give them some choices. And then how can we deal with some of the sensory issues? Sometimes a kid can learn to tolerate a noise he doesn't like or she doesn't like by letting them control the noisy thing like the vacuum cleaner or listen to a high fidelity audio recording where they can control it. Give some choices. Okay, scratchy clothes, let them go to the store and help shop for the clothes and they can feel them and then wash the clothes before they wear them. Go to the next slide. What's the ultimate goal of education? Where is a student 10 years after um, high school? I was doing the big dip fat projects. Let's go to the next slide. How did I get started in my business? Didn't do the regular interview process. I would show off my work. And there is my drawings right there. I would show off the work. Okay, here's an, another drawing right here. Okay, we'll go to the next slide. That's the drawing I used to sell Cargill. I sent that to the head of Cargill. I sold my work, not myself. Now I'll have a parent come up to me and I'll say, well, my kid's really a good artist. And I said, do you have that work on, the, on your phone? I just was at an a art show with some very, very talented artists. And, and I was trying to figure out how to get them to get commissions because that's where they can really get some money. You know, one really successful autistic artist is Grant, the eco artist. He's getting some ten and twenty thousand dollar, twelve thousand dollar commissions now. Yeah, that's kind of stuff I like. Let's go to the next slide. I got that picture was in the portfolio. You don't put too much junk in it. We'll just show you what's in the portfolio. Go on to the next slide. And that's a working replica that was used in the movie. One thing I loved about the HBO movie is it showed my jobs, and it also showed how I think. It showed exactly how my mind worked. Let's go to the next slide. I had a really nice brochure. And I had some good mentors that helped me get my business started. Because when Jim, a contractor, saw my work, he was hiring me to sell jobs and design jobs. Former Marine Corps captain starting a small business and very important mentor. He showed me how to start a business. How do you become incorporated? How do you get an LLC? He showed me how to do that. Let's go to the next slide. And that was one of the pictures that was in the portfolio. We'll go on to the next slide. I get lots of exercise. That helps a whole lot. We can go on to the next slide. All right, work experience. We need to have a slow transition from the world of school to the world of work. That starts with chores with little kids. At 13 years old, mother found me a sewing job just in the neighborhood with a seamstress that worked out of her home. I took apart dresses and I hemmed them. That was just done in the neighborhood. And I, at 15, I was cleaning horse stalls. Then I went out to my aunt's ranch. But another thing that I did when I was 17 is I had a little sign painting business. And what I had to learn from that is to make a sign somebody would want. See, this is oftentimes a problem with the art skill. The uh, kid just wants to make the art anime or something like that that they want. You've got to learn how to do the sign somebody wants. And my first sign for pay was for a hair salon. And I had to make a sign they would want. I put the Breck lady on it. I didn't know about copyright infringement. You know, that was back in the 60s. Uh, but learning those work skills, this is where we're really falling down. And, this, and now I'm seeing the people that own metal fabrication shops who are probably autistic retiring out and not getting replaced. Let's go to the next slide. Back doors to jobs. Half of all good jobs are back door. 
And I've seen many, many people have very, very successful backdoor jobs. I talked to a guy just recently. He uh, went to a factory that uh, does marble, makes things with marble, and he got a job polishing the marble. Then he learned how to uh, work the um, automated computerized marble cutters. You know what he's doing now? He flies all around the country fixing this equipment. That was backdoor. Let's go to the next slide. Okay, elementary school life skills training. I'm realizing how important this was. In my neighborhood in the 50s, when you were a little kid, you had to put on your good clothes and be party hosts at your parents' parties. That taught social skills. How to shake hands, taking turns at conversation, selling candy for charity, shopping for stuff. I already talked about that. I'm realizing now just how important this was. These kids today are not learning these skills. There were some advantages to a 50s upbringing where social skills were taught in a much more structured manner. Let's go to the next slide. Friends who shared interest, I already discussed that. We'll go on to the next slide. And here I took this ugly shed and I made it nice. This is stuff I was doing as a teenager. Let's figure out things in the neighborhood. I talked to a mom the other day and her daughter was having a really good time working at McDonald's. And they had figured out how to deal with the multitasking. Most of the time she ran the cash register. But when the store got super busy, they had her clean tables. They just figured that out. You know, he's got to figure this kind of stuff out. Go to the next slide. And there I am painting a sign for the Arizona State Fair. That's me up there. I had to get this job for paint this for this goofy exhibit. I showed an old sign painter at my portfolio. Let's go to the next slide. And I think we'll end on this slide, driving. If I had not learned to drive, I would not have been in the cattle industry. It's gonna take a whole lot longer. You have got to get the operation of the vehicle into motor memory before you do traffic. That might take three to five times longer, driving in absolutely, totally safe places. And my aunt's mailbox was three miles away on a dirt road. And I drove up to that every day for, for two months. And uh, we got it racked up 200 miles on dirt roads. Then I slowly went into traffic, got to learn how to drive. You know, now there's driving simulators that are becoming more available. Some of those may be helpful, but you're still gonna have to rack up some hours in the real vehicle. You know, and again, this is another thing. Kids scared to drive. Well, let's start out in the middle of a dry field or the middle of a parking lot. And let's find one with no light poles to hit. Yeah, got to do it. I'm seeing too many problems where the parents won't let go. Even the nonverbal kids, they can do more stuff than you think they can do. And some of those nonverbal kids can learn to type independently. And I want to encourage that. And we're now at the 30 minute mark. I think we'll end here on this driving slide. But I want to see these kids getting out there and be everything they can be. And, and I'm too many of them are not getting jobs. This is where we're falling down, the transfer to adulthood. Okay, we'll go into the interview now. Yeah, so I, thank you, Temple. I really appreciate you sharing with us. Um, I'm just listening to all you talked about. I, When you talked about different thinking styles, it got me thinking about how do those thinking styles apply to the world of therapy, right? So occupational therapy, mental health therapy, um even speech therapy and i i know from my mentor steve porges right that you guys have worked together in the past and so just thinking about this and thinking about some of the conversations i've had with him um i just really like to focus our interview on that if you're okay with okay, it okay well that that's fine with that but i'm seeing too many parents that just can't let go and i suggest the next time you buy gas Hand the kid a $5 bill, and while you're pumping gas, send the kid into the shop to buy something. And I've had parents say to me, they don't know if they can get up the guts to do that. I so met a 12 year old in the airport. I gave her a $5 bill and sent her across the hall to a shop, and she bought a drink. First time she'd ever bought something. Sure. Well, and I think for therapists, right? Like, I'm a mental health therapist. That's sort of my background. I think about how like when parents come in to talk to us right and they ask okay. us well how do we let our kid fail um i think what would be really helpful for some of us in the audience is 
to hear from you, like, how do you let that kid fail? Like, how do you sort well, of set learn, those parameters? You learn, you learn from mistakes. Okay, when I, this is one of my kids' books right here, Calling All Minds, and it has my childhood projects with little kites and things like that, and little airplanes. I spent hours tinkering little paper things. And a lot of them did fail, but they were little paper things. And I just learned to tinker and tinker and tinker. Kids are not doing that today. Do you think kids today are afraid of failing? Well, yeah, but the thing is, sometimes you do fail. But it's one thing to cut a paper snowflake around. One of the projects in Calling All Minds is a paper snowflake. And I had a teacher ask me in all seriousness, I couldn't believe this. Well, what if you cut the paper snowflake wrong and it falls apart? What happens to the kid's self-esteem? You get another piece of printer paper. It's just printer paper. And you right. cut it. Then you might look up on YouTube how to do it. You need to learn from that. And so when kids are little, okay, they fail on cutting up a, a paper snowflake. I, that Kids aren't learning that today. I couldn't believe it. Someone thought, cut a paper snowflake wrong and it fell apart, wreck a kid's self-esteem. Well, right. I mean, like, it's interesting the effect, like, COVID has had on this, too. Well, COVID's been it... horrible for, for young oh, people in the worst span. Oh, it's the worst. So I it's teach a college worst. class. I teach intro to social work. And one of the things I ran into this semester with my students was they didn't know how to do an interview, right? Like they are college freshmen, don't know how to do an interview, right? Like I can tell you but, how I did an interview was lay out the big two foot by three foot drawing and pull out the picture portfolio. Because right. I had a skill where I could sell it with the portfolio. And that's how I sold it. The other thing I did is I wrote in trade magazines cattle magazines, meat magazines about my projects, pictures and drawings and just how to build them. So I'm curious when we think about like mental health therapy um, or even speech therapy, when we think about how to translate things to kids in terms of that, if you have someone who's an extreme visual thinker, what do you think are some strategies we can use to engage that extreme visual thinker? Well, what, one thing mother did with me when I was like seven and eight years old, and I just drew the same horse head over and over again, she encouraged me to draw the whole horse. She encouraged me to use other media, such as watercolors. You take that thing the kid's interested, expand it. He likes cars, let's read about them. Let's learn how they work. Do math work. Take that so car right. interest and expand it. Um, so if we think about restrictive eating, right, that's a common problem to speech therapists. That's a common problem. I'll tell you what to do. Get to tell the kid you can have like four things you absolutely hate. And for me, raw egg white was like throw up. Okay, so we can have a few things you hate. And one thing that can help on that is get the kid involved with, with pre preparing the food. We can play with it in the kitchen. And we don't play with it at the dining room table. You've got to learn manners. We can play with food in the kitchen. Sometimes that's helpful. To help with restricted eating i also want to work on not getting it started too right well yeah and i mean all the food chemicals that go into it i think about just the like red dye 33 for instance oh yeah, right? yeah i want to get some of that stuff out but don't get hung up on that i'm more worried if you've got a kid that, that eats french fries and ice cream i'm scared they might get the old nutritional deficiency diseases there was a kid well, that the... had scurvy that's vitamin c deficiency because their diet was so restricted. Well, they it's do. Better, I mean, they they get... better be taking a multiple vitamin. Well, right. And I mean, like you get these kids who like won't poop for like six weeks, for instance. Right. And like it's because they're addicted to Elio's pizza because Elio's mm -hmm. pizza, for instance, has a biochemical that hooks these kids on. Well, um... I don't want to get into that kind of stuff. I just want to get the diet uh, more diverse. And let's play with food and work it work with it in the kitchen and and where they can smell it they can play with it and i tell you you can have four things you absolutely hate that i won't make you eat sure and other stuff you're going to have to try a little bit now i would have gotten into a very bad grilled cheese sandwich habit if that had been allowed i was allowed to have that on saturday for lunch you know, I would rather just, um, I, I take a very practical sort of no nonsense uh, view of this stuff. Sense rate, sound sensitivity. Okay, uh, let's say it's dogs barking. Well, let's get that on a high fidelity recording that doesn't clip the high frequencies and let the kid play with it and turning it on. Okay, then you got the kid wearing headsets all the time. 
that's going to make sound sensitivity worse. So what we want to do is you can have it with you, have it with you, and only wear it in the very worst places, like these bathrooms where you have all this automated stuff just going off at random. Yeah, you'd wear it in there. Well, I, I know for me, right, like when people get to me and they have autism and it's usually because things have gotten so bad that they're not manageable on their own. Like uh, I will have come, kids come in who like I can think of a kid when we started working together, he was violent towards other how, people. How old a kid was this? Tell me a little so more. This was a six year old, a six year old who managed to not only get kicked out of school, but get kicked out of day treatment as well, meaning the next step was residential. All right. Now, so was, by, this kid, was this kid verbal? Yes, the kid was verbal, verbal. Kicked out of school. Kicked out of school, kicked out of day treatment, right? Which is arguably one of the higher levels. So that means he had 20 hours of therapy a week. And But by working with me and working with um, an ABA therapist, we were able to get him back into school. And one of the things you touched on in your presentation yeah. that really made a difference is that sort of bottom-up process, right? Because exercise for him was sort of the regulating factor okay, right? that's important they need a lot of these kids are not getting enough exercise the other thing is uh let's work on things to get him more engaged what what's making him uh throw all these fits you see uh let's say this kid's good at math he might be six years old maybe he can do high school math then he should be doing high school math because he's well, going to be bored and turn into a behavior problem otherwise well right and i mean it, he was fascinating to work with because he could build a car engine at seven years old and drive well, then a let's car. study car engines then let's well, get right. an automotive textbook but there's also this real world pragmatic dynamic where he's got to function in school and like be able to sit still and so i think when you talk about movement right like well, in i think some of these kids need some sensory breaks they sometimes need sensory breaks now the other thing we got to check in the environment is flicker on led lights and you know how you can check that without your phone take a video in slow motion wave because i want to make sure you play it back in slow motion the bad leds will flicker and that doesn't bother everybody but that's something i want to check and and uh, some of these kids are going to need sensory breaks and uh, i want to take something he's interested in uh he might need some breaks where he needs to run around some movement breaks yeah, he may need some movement breaks, but that's right. So I'm guessing that a couple people in our, in our audience would like to know what kind of movement breaks do you think would be helpful for kids or adults? I think both are important to cover. I don't know. You could go on. I know you're not supposed to run in the halls at school, but maybe that's what he might need. You know, a lot of these kids are not getting enough exercise. Your mother used to say to me, go outside and run the energy out of you. I, yep. And and the other thing is sometimes there's, there's a lot of emphasis just on compliance. You know, if you start working on building the strength, now you never, never, never take something like drawing away, something that can turn into a career, you'd never take that away. Okay, so this sure. kid, well, let's, um, I'll get a, 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 every car company has manuals for the cars that you can get. You should give them a manual for the, for, for a car. Right. Yeah, you see, I'm thinking about let's move them way ahead. These kids have uneven skills. And right. they may need well, you know, when then then teaching the kid to read. When I was eight years old, I couldn't read. Mother taught me with phonics with a book that was worth reading. And we read it out loud, and I gradually sure. read more and more, and she read less and less. It's very, mm. very simple. But I think some of these kids are bored stiff. I'm the other thing is if the child's nonverbal, frustration because you can't communicate is a big thing, a lot big cause of bad behavior. Sure. A big, huge thing. Well, and, and how do you feel and safe? You gotta give them a way to communicate. Well, right. And how do you feel safe when you can't communicate, right? Like well, that's right. you can't get your needs met. It's next to impossible. Well, that that's just it. So what um I'm what helped to finally get this kid so it wasn't hitting or doing whatever he was doing get kicked out of all this stuff what ended up really working was that his mom and dad figured out that he was really competitive and so they would challenge him to do things like take the trash and like go throw it in the dumpster i bet you can do it faster than me he's like 
or they'd be like, I bet I can do it faster than you. And he'd turn around and actually like go outpace them because he grew up or he's growing up in a area where he's working with hard machines. Like you were talking about, he's learning skills like his parents are masons i think if i remember oh, right so he okay. goes out on construction sites all the time well good that's, about... that's something in turn of career construction sites see i don't think kids lots of times get shown enough interesting stuff no i talked to one contractor his eight-year-old's running the excavator machine and he was so short he had to stand in front of the seat and hold the controls this way so he could reach the pedals Sure. Oh my gosh, that's hilarious. He Do you remember sit in the seat because it was too small, but he figured out how to run it without sitting in the seat. Do you remember well, the show The Magic School Bus by Chance? Oh, I've vaguely. I've... So there was this character, she had this red hair, and she used to say, take chances, get messy, and make mistakes. And I just, yeah. I don't know if you see that in schools not happening, but I, well, I see that. See, you see the simple things going back to the paper snowflake i couldn't believe it that a teacher asked me in all seriousness that a you know a second grader's self-esteem be ruined if a paper snowflake fell apart that's the sort of thing you just need to it's just a piece of printer paper it's all it is get normalizing and try again and then they then this is where i'm am a favor of long then we go look on youtube and we learn how to make it you know, and you 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 figure out how to make it. See, kids just aren't doing enough of those real simple things like that. Are you familiar with Edtronic and any of the Still Faces experiment? No, I'm not. So Edtronic talks a lot about attachment, right? And so he has this experiment where this mother and this little girl, um, they're like mirroring each other's actions, and then the mom does this still face, and she stops. And so the kid very quickly starts freaking out and decompensating, and then the parent comes back. But what it really highlights is sort of this notion of rupture, repair, and attunement, right? So in every human relationship, um, whether you're doing psychotherapy, occupational therapy, education, right, you have this notion of kind of what you're talking about, right? Like, it's almost like in the best cases of scenarios and relationships, 33% of the time we get it right, 33% of the time we get it wrong. And 33% of the time, we're working to repair that. And so I think about that in terms of what you're talking about. It's almost like kids are afraid, or teachers are afraid to rupture the relationship with the kids. And parents are afraid to rupture the relationship with their children. Oh, no, because... that's getting into some jargon. It starts to get over my head. But I just, you know, I remember a crafts class, little paper things. Oh, and in the 50s, we made ashtrays. I'm, they would never do that today. <laughs> but I, that's what we made in when we did clay. I, and you do something wrong, and then you correct it. I, when I was 12, I wrecked a sewing project. I cut the fabric wrong, ruined it, and throw it out. Couldn't get more of the same fabric. I learned from that, be more careful before you cut the fabric. I was maybe 12 when I did this. That didn't hurt my self-esteem. Well, that was going to be my next Throwing question. It, out, it was, was a pair of like? pants I was making for mother, really pretty fabric, and I had to throw the whole project out. Be more careful. That's what I learned from that. That Now, the things that were hurting me that were horrible as a teenager was getting bullied. That was the mm -hmm. worst part of my life. And I want to commend really good teachers I had. They gave me interesting projects to get me motivated to study. But friends who shared interests, that's extremely important for these kids. And and mother had a very good sense of how to stretch me. So I wouldn't just draw the same horse head over and over again. She got me doing a beach with watercolors and, you know, broadening my art skill. So she widened it. She widened it. That's right. You know, like like some kids will draw the same anime character over and over again and then they post it online and it gets removed for copyright infringement well then okay that's a mistake there i explained to the kid now if you can make a character that they don't take down then you've done right. something totally original right okay, that's the lesson i would get from that i actually talked to several kids that would had that experience and said now you've got to draw something original and then they won't take it down Learn so, is it, so is it fair for me to say 
that you'd recommend to OT, speech therapists, mental health therapists, that engaging kids where they're failing is a really important step? Well, yeah, now the thing is algebra, that you can get so much emphasis on that, that um, you don't do enough on building up the skill. You see, I'm okay. very career and oriented. I worked with shop people, some of them who barely graduated from high school. They were patenting, like there's a hide pulling device that's used in the beef industry. That guy in the shop invented it. He didn't get first offer on a patent, which really ticks me off. Um, but they would, they just saw how how to make it work. And, and these are good careers. You see, this is the thing that, that um, you know, now the kid's playing video games in the basement. You got an adult video game player. I got five or six cases for the auto mechanics. They found that was more interesting. It was the only thing that worked. They found motors were more interesting than video games. Sure. I wish these kids were getting top video game jobs, but they're not. You see, you gotta remember, I come out of 25 years of heavy construction, which really affects how I think. Construction's all about outcomes. You gotta build a project, you gotta make it work. Well, and it sort of feels like there's a veer away from outcomes because again, we're afraid of damaging self-esteem. Well, I don't, you know, but when you learn from it, I explained to the girl who'd had her anime, she was copying Disney characters from Disney and Force mm. Cup, right? And I explained to her that you need to work on making a character that is original. And you put that up and then they won't take it down. And I explained how the lawyers work on that. Right. Okay, now let's work on making some original characters. Let's learn from this mistake. And she'd had several things taken down that she had done on the automated program that would take down the Disney characters. And I explained to her how that worked. Okay, let's use that as a learning thing. I want to okay. work on your art skill so you make original characters, not copies of other people's stuff. Well, right. And what a talent to get her artwork taken down yeah. by an well, well, it right. got taken down because she was uh, making pictures of Mickey Mouse, and those are going to get, and Donald Duck, and those are going to get taken down. And they were highly accurate to your point That's about just thinking. They right? were like, highly accurate. That's right. I saw them. But I said, what you got to do is you want to work on making your own characters. And then when you put them up and they don't take them down, now you're going to know that they are original. You see, I tried to, now I'm trying to put a positive spin on this. Sure. So you, you ended with some real positivity and strengthening. Yeah. Like we're taking this strength and we're going to tweak it and widen it a little bit. Well, because you you want to make your own characters. You want to like do art that's truly original. And it's an automated system that takes them down. And it determines how original they are. Okay, so I explained how it worked. But let's use that. And she'd had a couple of things taken down. You see, my mind only works in specific examples. So now you need to make up your own cartoon character. That's your own creation. And if they don't take it down, then you know it's original. Sure. So okay, did... that's taking something negative and, and first of all, explaining why it was taken down. But you see, being in construction, um, it's about outcomes. I don't want to see this kid ending up in the basement on disability check when maybe he ought to be working for Google. Right. Right now, there's been a lot of layoffs in tech, but I just read my new business week this morning. You know what the car industry is doing? The car industry is snapping up all the tech employees that have been laid off. They put boosts up at the convention and say, join us, we're hiring. So you can go work on, on autonomous driving. You know, I, I'd like to see them in some cool job like that or working on skill, a high-end skilled trade. Maybe own their own shop. These are things right. I can good outcomes. A guy working in a that's repairing automated marble cutting equipment. That's somebody I had I had lunch with him a, a a month ago. That's a real example. That's so cool. Um, it must have been really neat to meet with somebody who does those high tech things. And I'm guessing you see a lot of this because you get to go a lot of really. Well, I've been to a lot of places, and and I also read tons of business things. I, I read I Business Week. I read The Economist. And I just read my brand new Business Week. Just read it this morning about how these laid off tech employees right now, the car industry is snapping them up. Yep. 
So there's another industry that's expanding. You know, like so the auto or legacy uh, tech companies are laying them off. Right. The car industry wants to get all electronic. And so they're snapping up these choice people. Right. And they're all trying to catch up to Elon Musk, who again was autistic. Oh, and the other thing about Elon Musk is he's the kind of guy who's a startup guy. You see now SpaceX is a mature company. There's an engineer lady suit who runs that company now. So and when he first started, he destroyed the launch pad. She was crucial in not having NASA just throw them out. You see, so that, it, you see, she's a more organized person, and SpaceX is a mature company. They need to just crank out the launches now and not have problems with them. But he had to fail to get there. Well, yeah, he blew up a launch pad. He he's blown up quite a bit of stuff, <laughs> and and I think some of it was rushing. But you see, that's the startup guy. And and I found that in the meat industry, there's some people who are very good at starting up plants up, but running them's boring. Mm. See, now SpaceX, for example, just has to crank out reliable launches and a whole lot of them, and not destroy people's satellites in the process. Sure. Well, and it kind of gets at what you were talking about when you talked about how you wrote your book, right? Like that's you right. find partnerships. Well, that's right, because what I did with visual thinking is is I could write kind of associative, disorganized, rough drafts, and Betsy would smooth them all out. Okay, Elon Musk started SpaceX, but now he's got a lady engineer suit, who now it's just, it's just humming along and running. Mm, kind of like this book, and I mean, your recent New York Times article too. Well, and then um, Betsy worked on that. I wrote rough drafts, Betsy worked on it, but two New York Times editors also worked on it, and they changed the order of some of the stuff. So there was some failing in that process too. Well, yeah, because one thing I've learned is since I write scientific journal articles and reviewers rip everything apart, well, as long as they accept a major revision, they can rip it apart it's, all they want. Right, it's but, been accepted. <laughs> but they, they, um, I, I'm used to having my stuff edited. But there's mm. some people that can't stand to have their stuff edited. Sure. Do you think that's a fear? Well, it it's it gets back to well the child is protected from having a paper snowflake that falls apart then maybe yeah. he, need, he needs to have that she you know your little craft project fail then you figure out how to correct it that's going to help you grow up if you're totally shielded uh well then you have something fail at work do you think we take out the opportunity to fail in special education well, I think sometimes we're, so, I, I couldn't believe it when a teacher worried about a, a, a paper snowflake falling apart and wrecking a kid's self-esteem. Sure. First of all, I'm going to say, it's just a piece of printer paper. Let's get another piece and try again. And then if it still falls apart, we'll go to YouTube and we're going to learn how to do it on YouTube. And then we're going to do it. That's the way to handle it. And you fold it differently so it will not fall apart. Well, and that's and, something you learn in second grade. Well, right. I, I, I think about one of my students. He's openly autistic. Um, and he's doing he's doing social science research. He's interviewing parents of kids on the spectrum in Turkey and the US. Okay. And so, but he was in special education in high school and has had to utilize the writing lab quite a bit. And okay. part of the process has been a ton of editing of his work. Well, and so when you to accept editing. And then the way I look at it on the editing, there's certain things uh, like viewpoints, like in a, like a New York Times article, I want to get across. I said, no, we're not taking that out. And then sure. the New York Times editor took out something. And I go, yeah, we can take that out. Sure. But things like the skill loss stuff, no, that's mm. not coming out. That's one of my main theses. You know, you're not, I'm not gonna let you just gut my article. All right, and I imagine. Um, Go ahead. The Sorry. other thing is you take like in these developing countries, okay, like Turkey, for example, I've been, I haven't been to Turkey, but I've been down in Mexico and they have all these little tiny shops in these countries, little tiny shops. And I look at that and I go, I can put a 10 year old in that vegetable stand and start learning, have them start learning some work skills. Sure. I'm just looking for the opportunities there. Sure. 
So it's like you see the opportunities. I see the opportunities. You see another, a lot of people don't see doors. There's a scene in the HBO movie where I go up and I get the editor's card because I knew if I worked for that magazine and I wrote for that magazine that helped my career, I went up and I got the card. These doors are everywhere and people don't see them. Mm. They don't see them. And then I got a press pass that got me into big, expensive national meetings for free with $500 registration fees in the 70s. Right. And I recognized that door. Sure. And it and and I he was at a cattle event and just like the movie showed it. And I went up and I got the card. That happened. So you took a chance. And then I produced a decent article. And I want to thank my teachers for red marking up my work. Some people think that hurts self-esteem. Red map marking up my work, making me write book reports. So I learned how to summarize. Right. And we've got kids today with awful writing skills. And I find out that nobody ever marked up their work. Well, and I, I agree. I mean, like my student, I come back to him and I think about um, how his writing has just taken, it's totally transformed. Good. Like it is completely different now, but he says to me over and over and over again, hey, Sean, I really don't feel like I have my own voice. And part of it is because he, when he went through high school, just got pushed through. Well, and, and, and then you develop, you know, what your, what your voice is. Well, now there's this open AI. And um, I just read an article in Nature just the other day that they were look, they were trying to see which scientific abstracts for paper were written by OpenAI and which one were written by the scientists. And they had mm. a hard time determining. Um, so if I want to teach kids writing, I think we're going to have to bring them into the classroom, have them write longhand and put all the tech inside their bags completely. Well, and there's kind of a magic that comes from having a whiteboard or a piece of paper, right? I don't know about how you write books, but when I write, I like to draw things. Um, okay, I don't that's do that. Totally, but... Do you do that in your process? No, I write. I still write by hand. I never learned to type correctly. Uh, and so I think better writing by hand. In fact, Stephen King, the famous novelist, he uh, writes by hand with a Parker fight, fountain pen. Does he really? Yes, he does. He put that as an acknowledgement in one of his books. The world's so finest cool. word processor, the Parker fountain pen. That's so cool. I, I just, but I mean, there's some beauty in those things, right? Like there's some real beauty in those things that make us slow down and be mindful. Um, the thing is, I want to see these kids get decent jobs. I've gone out to the tech companies. I mean, half those programmers are probably on the spectrum. See then what happened during COVID, they went crazy with hiring. You see like Peloton, that exercise company, they about went broke. See, now people are going back to the real gyms where they can do exercising with people. Right. Um, and and uh, people want to do stuff with people. So these companies are overhired. But now sure. there's another industry called the automobile industry that's snapping those workers up. Sure. And and I think therapists ought to be maybe reading Business Week and some of these things or The Economist. <laughs> so you yeah. know something about the job market. I know where the jobs are at. Sure. So just therapists, about every industry. Well, right. So therapists familiarizing themselves with the Wall Street Journal. The I think New York so, Times. I think a therapist reading the Wall Street Journal might be a really good idea. I was given the Wall Street Journal by my father when I was in high school. And it was interesting reading about the old the fights that went on with the CEOs of some company and it sounds <laughs> kind of like a soap opera. Right. Have you ever seen the show Succession? haven't seen that show no so it's loosely based off the murdoch family okay the whole it's a drama but it follows right like all the ins and outs of being wealthy and owning and having influence and failing in a place like that kind of like also dropping learned very early in my career that having private jets in your garage does not buy happiness i learned that in my 20s because i worked for some clients that had ranches or play things Maybe that was an important thing to learn. Say back so. in the 70s, a Learjet was the hot jet. Now it's a citation. But uh, you know, Learjet and two barons in your hangar does not buy happiness. That's an important thing to learn in your 20s. Because I, I, I designed stuff for some of those clients. And they also were, were some of my, they could be my best clients. They also could be my absolute worst clients and not pay for uh, the drawing. That sounds so hard. Well, 
And I, it sounds like you learn from all I kinds of experiences. I remember seeing the hangar with the three airplanes in it. The guy was a complete jerk. I told him not to build his corral down in the mud hole, but he did that anyway. And it was a mud hole. Uh, I believe that. So yeah. I want to just summarize and make sure I highlight some of the things you talked about, and then we'll just kind of wrap up. All right, um, let's but, do that. So just to summarize again, failure is a really important part of learning. Well, it's an important part of learning, and I'd rather have them learn it, start learning with, with a, a little projects of no consequence, like paper snowflakes. Sure. And and how you can learn, you know, with from failure. I wrecked sewing project when I was twelve. Right. I learned from that. With developmentally appropriate scaffolding, right? Because oh, it was a yeah, pair of pants. That's, that's, it wasn't that's right. Crashing and the car. I, had this, I remember throwing the whole thing away because it was, it was the fabric was a remnant. There was no way to get more of the fabric because sure. we bought remnants because they were cheap. Right. Fabric odds and ends. Sure. I then, but you learn from that. And 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 neither one of those things was you know financially really con you know. Like, not like a car either one of those it was maybe a couple of dollars worth of cloth back then that i ruined getting parents to really and therapists to really think about how do we help kids fail in a safe way in a safe way and and the other thing i want to do on the first jobs is i want to avoid the multitasking chaos like the takeout windows right so I, taking i also want to avoid the long strings of verbal instruction then say, hey, give them a pilot's checklist. Then I heard a sad story just the other day, because I think in specific examples, oh, this boy got his dream job, going to sell video games at Walmart. Just heard about this one. Got fired because customers complained he was too aggressive. If he just had a little coaching on how to approach customers, and you approach a customer and they don't want to engage, you back off from the customer. Right. A little coaching on that, he wouldn't have lost that job. Oh, yeah. come on now. So coaching, having therapists well, be familiar. Coach them, like you said, we'll come up and, um, you, know, you know, let's say I've actually done retail floor for selling books. I was really good at it. So I'd go up to somebody and say, I'm, I'm a professor of animal science. I have a book about animal behavior. And it was animals make us human. And I pulled the book out. Mm -hmm. and I sold 60 hardback books that afternoon. But if the customer didn't engage, I backed off. Sure. Okay, so you you tell them, well, you're going to go up and say, well, this is the latest, you know, uh, uh, video game, and they're not. If they're interested, then you you, you demonstrate it to them. If they're not interested, you back off. You've got to learn that. Oh, and I think they have to fail in doing that and have the well, space. And to it's too fail. bad, but I think you know, a little bit of coaching, right. maybe that wouldn't have failed. You know, this is where you kind of get together with the store manager, and. And uh, you have the coach like stand 25 feet away and watch. And they've got too aggressive with the customer. You can say, now, wait a minute, that customer wasn't interested in that video game. You needed to back off. Watch Susie, how she sells stuff. Sure. A little bit of coaching. He lost a dream job. Right. That's a sure. Well, yeah. And I, I think about how if he had just had a little more patience on the part of the manager, that would have made. Well, and the thing is, is the little bit of coaching. Um, you see it, it was, you know, because it's, you know, I actually, when I did this book signing at this store that hadn't advertised it, um, I thought it was really good work in retail floor. I'd pick out the families with kids and I'd go, I'm a, I have a book about animal behavior. Do you have a pets? And if they engaged, I engaged them. If they didn't engage, I backed off and waited for the next person to come by me and they couldn't get to the meat counter without going by me with book table. Sure. Really good. 60 hardback books I sold, <laughs> and the rest of the book table only sold three. <laughs> well, it has been a pleasure, Temple. I have truly enjoyed getting to talk to you, and I know our audience is going to be really grateful for you taking the time to talk a little bit about your book, um, the ways you actually learn from the editing process, um, how you worked as a team member, and how you value coaching. No, and I, value, I value coaching. And on my very first uh, uh, cattle job, I criticized some welding. I said, look like bird do. And the plant engineer pulled me in private and explained that that was not appropriate talk. 
and that I had to apologize for that. He sure. told me what I should do. But that was helpful, I'm guessing. That was helpful. But sure. And it... things that you see, and the thing is, it doesn't often doesn't take that much coaching. Right. And, and a little bit of coaching, that kid wouldn't have lost that job at Walmart selling video games. Okay, I can see for an autistic kid, that's a dream job. I think that's very sad he lost it. Yeah. And maybe he'll have another opportunity where he can get those opportunities. Well, maybe try another store. But you see, the thing I did is I just had a little spiel. And if the customer engaged, I engaged. And if they didn't, I backed off. And then, yeah, then you get a customer that's interested. They're not going to want to talk to you for an hour about video games. Sure. But you see, the thing is that specialized retail, where there specialized knowledge of a product is appreciated. Right. And that's when that overexcitement is appreciated. Yeah, you say, well, this is the new, you know, whatever game just came out, it's just so cool. And 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 this is why it's really good. Hmm. Oh no, so awesome. You gotta use the right terminology now. So gotta be with awesome. the times. Yeah. <laughs> well, thank you, Temple.